Let us embark upon a journey through time where empires clash and cultures blend in the theater of human endeavor. Rome and the Barbarians, a tale not of mere conquest, but of mutual transformation, echoing through the annals of history. The strategic new of Rome, shaped and honed by its encounters with these so-called barbarians, transcends the mere art of war. It is a testimony to Roman adaptability, a virtue as crucial to the state as to the individual. Adaptability, yes, but let's not cloak ambition and aggression in the garb of pragmatism. Rome's expansion was hardly a benign enterprise. It was powered by a relentless pursuit of dominance with all the complexities that entailed. And yet, Rome's leaders often failed to match their ambition with wisdom. The seeds of downfall lie not in external barbarian pressure, but within the internal failings of Rome's governance, a cycle of history that seems inevitable. The narrative of Rome and the barbarians is one of unity and virtue. Through the lens of Roman ideals, we see not just conflict, but the osmosis of cultures, a testament to Rome's greatness. Personal ambition, too, played its part, stirring the pot of history. The alliances and conflicts with barbarian tribes were often as much about personal glory as they were about Rome's destiny. Our discussion will uncover these layers, peeling back the veneer of the historical record to reveal the pulsing heart of human drama beneath. Rome and the Barbarians, a story that charts the course of civilization itself. Civilization, perhaps, but at what cost? The answer is etched not only on the battlefields, but in the lives forever changed by this grand design. Indeed, the cost is steep, measured not in gold or land, but in the irreversible alteration of countless societies. This includes Rome itself, transformed by those it sought to conquer. Transformation or degradation. Rome's internal decay was mirrored in its external endeavors. The barbarian is not merely at the gates, he is within them, and perhaps has been all along. Yet, this intermingling of cultures under the banner of Rome sowed the seeds of a shared identity, a legacy far outlasting the empire's earthly bounds. Personalities loom large in this saga, their ambitions igniting the flames of history. Yet, amid the clash of empires, it is their human stories that resonate through the ages. Through our discourse, we shall navigate these turbulent waters, exploring the manifold dimensions of Rome's engagement with the barbarian world. Our journey through history is but beginning. Let us delve into the evolution and impact of Roman military tactics against the barbarian hordes, a canvas depicting the art of war through time. Polybius, your insights would be the ideal spearhead. Indeed, Herodotus. The Roman military machine did not spring forth fully formed. It was hammered on the anvil of necessity. Confrontations with the Samnites, Gauls, and later the Germanic tribes served as crucibles for innovation. The flexibility of the manipular formation a tactical adaptation from the phalanx, allowed Rome to engage more effectively with the diverse warfare styles of these so-called barbarians. And yet, how reliable are our sources on these tactical evolutions? The penchant for embellishment among historians, no offense, Polybius, often obscures the truth. The effectiveness of Roman strategies against barbarians is less a testament to their military genius and more to their logistical and organizational superiority. Your skepticism has merit, Thucydides, but you underestimate the cunning of Roman leadership. Their ability to assimilate and adapt strategies from their barbarian adversaries was unparalleled. They turned the very ferocity and unpredictability of these tribes against them. Yet, it is this same adaptability that often blurred the lines between Roman and barbarian, diluting the essence of Rome itself. Tacitus, while your point about the Romans learning from their adversaries holds true, it's crucial to recognize that this adaptability was a strength, not a weakness. The true essence of Rome was not in its purity, but in its capacity to evolve. That is the hallmark of lasting empires. The adaption of military tactics is a mere reflection of Rome's broader societal values. Rome's true mastery lay in its ability to unite diverse peoples under its banner, not just through conquest, but through the integration of allied barbarian forces into its legions. This is not the dilution of Roman essence, but the expansion of its dominion, ensuring its legacy. Expansion that often came with a cost, Livy. The eagerness to integrate and adapt signs of barbarian vigor led to internal decay. 
the continuous reliance on barbarian troops eroded the discipline and virtues that once defined the Roman military. Indeed, the debate on whether Rome's military evolution marked its zenith or sowed the seeds of its decline is as old as history itself. Each of you presents a mosaic of perspectives that, when combined, reveal the complex interplay between Rome and the barbarian world. It is through such discussions we uncover the multifaceted nature of history, where adaptation and decay walk hand in hand. Let us delve into the marrow of Rome's strategic alliances with certain barbarian groups. Were these alliances forged through sheer strategic mastery, or did they spring from a well of survival instinct? Livy, your patriotism might cast Rome's actions in a noble light, but share with us your insights. Rome's alliances were not born merely out of necessity, but from a grand vision of a unified world under Roman ideals. It's simplistic to view these actions as mere survival tactics. I recount the tale of the Latin League, an alliance that showcased not only Rome's desire for unity, but also its unmatched ability to lead diverse groups towards a common goal. This wasn't desperation, this was the display of Rome's destined leadership. While Livy romanticizes, it behooves us to dissect these alliances with a pragmatist lens. Rome indeed sought unity, but it was the unity of submission under its rule. Their alliances, strategic as they were, served dual purposes. They weakened opposition by dividing them and ensured Rome's military might was bolstered by those it might otherwise face as foes. It's a testament to Roman pragmatism, securing their survival by the sword and the olive branch alike. I beg to differ with Polybius's dry analysis. My accounts reveal the flesh and blood behind these alliances, the ambitions and personal motives driving Rome's elite. Julius Caesar himself pursued alliances with barbarian tribes not merely for Rome's glory, but his own. His liaisons were as much about personal gain as they were about Roman advancement. It's critical to remember that Rome's strategies were often swayed by individual desires as much as by collective strategy. And yet one cannot ignore the underlying cynicism in Rome's diplomatic engagements. These alliances, strategic they may be, often veiled Rome's insatiable expansionist appetite. By my studies, not all that Rome touched was gold, and not all its alliances brought peace or unity. The subjugation and subsequent rebellions within these allied factions painted a stark picture of alliances frayed by Roman betrayal and opportunism. Polybius speaks of pragmatism, Livy of destiny, Suetonius of ambition, and Tacitus of betrayal. Thucydides, your skepticism is a lantern light in this discussion. Share your critique. Our discourse on Rome's alliances treads a complex ground betwixt strategy and survival, yet each of you orbits the truth without landing. Rome's diplomatic ventures, as much as they were inspired by immediate strategic necessities, were equally driven by the longer vision of survival in an unpredictable and hostile milieu. Their alliances, though sometimes marred by opportunism and personal vendettas, showcased a state attempting to navigate the turbulent waters of geopolitics. It's simplistic to cast Rome as either a Machiavellian state or a martyred civilization seeking unity. The reality is painted in shades far more intricate than black and white. Indeed, the weave of history is complex, with each thread colored by the perspectives of its beholder. Rome's alliances with barbarian groups resonates through history as a multifaceted saga of survival, ambition, and strategy, entangled with the personal motivations and ideals of its leaders. Let us turn our gaze upon the economic interweavings between Rome and its barbarian neighbors. A relationship as complex as it was crucial, marked by mutual dependence yet shadowed by imperial disdain. That disdain you mention masks a vital truth. Rome's economy in essence was far from self-sufficient. It leaned heavily on the resources and goods trafficked from these so-called barbarian lands. Gold from the Gauls, grain from Africa, and slaves, oh, the multitude of slaves, that oiled the gears of Roman industry and luxury. Indeed, Thucydides. But let's not overlook the strategic genius behind these economic entanglements. Rome's control over these trade routes was no accident. It was a display of pragmatism. Integrating the barbarians into their economic sphere was a method of pacification, making them stakeholders in the Roman peace. Ah. 
But you oversimplify, Polybius, dressing imperialism in the robes of pragmatism. Remember, for Romans, embracing barbarian goods was not merely an economic strategy, but a moral failing. Our forebears saw it as diluting Roman virtues, importing not just goods, but barbarian customs and luxuries that weakened the moral fabric. It's a tale as old as Cato the Elder, warning against the luxuria and corrupting softness brought by Eastern riches. Livy, your nostalgic moralism blinds you to the hypocrisy of such sentiments. Rome gorged itself on the resources and spoils of the barbarian world, while simultaneously decrying their influence as moral poison. It's the epitome of Roman arrogance, viewing themselves as superior beings whilst their economy, their very way of life, was propped up by those they deemed lesser. And let's not forget the personal ambitions fueling these economic ties. Emperors and generals alike paraded exotic treasures and slaves before the Roman masses not solely for Rome's glory, but to engrave their own names in history. The plunder from Germania, Britannia, and beyond often served less to bolster Rome's economy and more to inflate the reputations of those bringing the loot through triumphal processions. You're sidestepping the underlying brilliance of Rome's strategy, even if marred by individual greed. Their dominance over trade networks allowed them not only economic might, but also facilitated the spread of Roman culture and law. In a way, economic dependencies were a more effective means of control than any legion. A brilliant strategy built on exploitation and hypocrisy. Polybius, let's not adorn imperial ambition and economic opportunism with laurels they don't deserve. The so-called integration was a yoke placed on the necks of the barbarians, a tool for Rome to draw wealth and resources while offering little in return. It seems then that our discussions uncover the dual nature of Rome's engagements with the world beyond its borders, a blend of economic wisdom and cultural arrogance, strategic integration and moral duplicity. The seeds of Rome's economic practices are, in many ways, a reflection of humanity's broader story, a tale of ambition, exploitation, and the complex dance between civilizations. Let us dive into the mingling rivers of cultures where Rome and the barbarians both drank and sometimes poisoned the waters. The cultural exchanges, these were far from mere trifles of fashion or cuisine, but the very marrow of transformation for societies. Who will inaugurate our debate? I'll plunge into these waters, though they may be muddied by idealism. The exchanges, they were not always the result of amiable interactions, but rather the spoils of conquest and the necessities of cohabitation. The adoption of barbarian trousers by Romans is not merely a tale of fashion, but a symbol of Rome's adaptability and its subtle concession to the practicality of those it deemed barbaric. This was not peaceful integration, but cultural survival. Tacitus, always so stern, yet he ignores the deliciously intricate details. Did you know that Emperor Nero had a penchant for barbarian tunics? Oh, indeed. It was a sartorial choice that scandalized the Senate. These personal quirks, they illuminate the profound interweaving of lives, how barbarian influences crept even into the emperor's palace, a testament to the depth of their cultural penetration. While Suetonius revels in the palace gossip, let's not lose sight of the broader strategic implications. The Romans, ever pragmatic, appropriated not just clothing, but also barbarian gods, military tactics, and engineering knowledge. This enabled them not only to dominate their enemies, but to absorb and redefine their strengths. Rome's greatness was, was in its ability to assimilate and improve upon the customs and techniques of those it conquered. Indeed, Polybius, Rome, was a crucible of cultures. But let us not forget the arts and letters. The barbarians brought with them not just gods and goods, but tales and songs that enriched the Roman imagination. The very fabric of Roman literature bears the marks of these encounters, weaving into its epic narratives the echoes of barbarian lore. Yet, we must ask ourselves, at what cost these exchanges? In our eagerness to celebrate cultural diffusion, we overlook the erosion of traditional Roman virtues. The gravitas and simplicitas of our forebears gave way to a hybrid culture, where the Roman spirit was diluted with foreign elements. This was not merely exchange, it was an adulteration, a loss of our identity, amidst the cacophony of external influences. The table is richly set with perspectives from the strategic to the personal, from the praising of integration to the lamenting of lost purity. 
the exchanges between Rome and the barbarians were complex, layered with meaning both profound and mundane. It is clear that these interactions shape the empire in ways that are still being untangled today. Let us delve into the impact of Roman engineering and technology on their engagements with barbarian forces. Polybius, you often commend Rome's strategic ingenuity. Would you care to illuminate their advancements? Indeed, Rome's prowess in engineering and technology was a cornerstone of their dominion. Their roads, which I've extensively studied, not only facilitated the swift movement of legions, but also symbolized Roman civilization piercing through the barbaric wilderness. It was this blend of military and civil engineering that fortified their borders and cities against the barbarian menace. The siege engines, aqueducts, and fortifications speak to a society that melded practicality with innovation to maintain its grip on power. Yet, your glorification of Roman engineering omits the crucial fact that these marvels were not insurmountable. My analytical approach compels us to consider, technology alone does not secure victory. The Spartans at Thermopylae, vastly outnumbered, used tactical wisdom over superior technology. Similarly, there were instances where barbarians, learning from Roman tactics and technology, turned the tables. It underscores the principle that ingenuity in warfare often trumps technological superiority. Thucydides, while your skepticism has merit, let us not understate the spirit of Roman ingenuity. Our city's legendary foundation, as I've narrated, was fortified by divine auspices and engineering genius alike. The Roman ability to construct enduring edifices bridges that tamed nature, and roads that wove the empire together are testaments to our ancestors' foresight and virtues. These achievements were not merely functional but symbolic, inspiring awe and unity under the Roman banner. Yet, your romanticizing Livy masks the darker undertones of this so-called Roman genius. The same roads that united the empire also enabled the swift movement of legions to quell rebellion. Aqueducts that brought life-giving water also tethered conquered peoples to Rome's will. The engineering marvels you laud were instruments of control, subtle chains of dependency. Rome's true genius lay in its ability to cloak its dominion in the guise of civilization and progress. On a note less abstract and more grounded in tangible evidence, let's not overlook the individual architects of these wonders. My accounts detail the lives of emperors who fashioned Rome with grandiose constructions. Take Caesar Augustus, who boasted he found Rome a city of bricks and left it a city of marble. These leaders knew the value of technology and engineering, not just for martial superiority, but for crafting an immortal legacy in stone and mortar. Their personal ambitions fueled the technological advancements we admire. A fascinating exchange, indeed. From Polybius's praise of Roman civil-military engineering as a bastion of their supremacy to Thucydides' reminder that tactical wit can eclipse technological advantage. Livy, you illuminate the ideologically charged nature of Roman engineering, while Tacitus, you peel back these layers to reveal a mechanism of dominion. And Suetonius, you humanize these grand designs, tracing them back to the ambitions of rulers. Our discourse highlights the multifaceted impact of engineering on Rome's interactions with the barbarian world, both as a tool of unity and control for legacy and for domination. Let us delve into the currents that carried the barbarian migrations across the Roman Empire. Dissatisfaction brewed within the borders, not simply a tale of conquest, but a saga of desperation and survival. A simplistic overview. The migrations were not merely movements spurred by necessity, but strategic expansions influenced by Rome's declining vigilance. These tribes saw cracks within the empire's formidable facade and pressed hard against them. Indeed, the causes were complex, intertwined with Rome's inability to maintain its extensive borders. The Goths, Vandals, and Huns didn't just stumble upon a weakened Rome by chance. They were attracted by the empire's splendor but repelled by its arrogance and decay. Decay is the operative word. Internal strife, corruption, and a dilution of Roman virtues made the empire ripe for invasions. The barbarian migrations were symptoms of Rome's self-inflicted wounds, an empire dying from within long before the barbarians delivered the death blows. Both of you paint a picture as if Rome was merely a victim of its own decadence, 
neglecting the valor and strategic brilliance that once made her the envy of the world. The migrations challenged Rome, yes, but they also led to moments of unity and resurgence, even if ultimately fleeting. These movements were not unidirectional. They shaped not only the trajectory of Rome, but also the very fabric of European identity, intertwining and remixing cultures in ways we can continue to unravel. Speaking of remixing cultures, it's fascinating how the leaders on both sides exploited these migrations for personal glory. Emperors sought to bank victories against barbarians to bolster their legacies, while barbarian chiefs saw in Rome a glittering prize to cement their names in song and story. Such personal ambitions played a role, but let's not oversimplify. The broader socio-political landscape dictated these migrations more significantly than the whims of a few. Population pressures, climate change, the lure of Rome's wealth, they all contributed to a complex mosaic of cause and effect. Equally fascinating is the military adaptation on both sides. Rome, with its disciplined legions against barbarians, whose tactics were often misjudged as mere savagery. There was a mutual learning curve, albeit one that ultimately could not prevent Rome's decline. A decline that was, as I've noted, exacerbated by these migrations. They exposed Rome's vulnerabilities, military, economic, and political. The empire was a giant too stubborn to adapt, too unwieldy to swiftly react to the inexorable barbarian tide. And yet, from the chaos of migration and invasion, new orders emerged, reshaping the continent. The legacy of these movements is not one of mere conquest and defeat, but of cultural synthesis and the dawn of a new era, laying the foundations for the Europe we know today. The discussion, vibrant and contentious, mirrors the very tumult that these migrations wrought upon the ancient world. Let's delve into the intriguing blend of religious practices between Rome and the barbarians. A shared god or goddess could act as a bridge or a battleground. Indeed. The incorporation of barbarian gods into Roman worship was nothing short of pragmatic statecraft. The Romans recognized the utility in adopting and assimilating these deities, thus easing the process of Romanization. It was a way to control the newly conquered peoples by acknowledging their gods, thereby making the yoke of conquest somewhat lighter. Pragmatic, perhaps, but also a demonstration of Rome's lack of spiritual integrity. This so-called strategy weakened the core of Roman identity, diluting its own pantheon with foreign elements. What is political expedience if it leads to moral decay? On the contrary, Tacitus, this blending showcased Rome's greatness, its capacity to unify diverse cultures under its auspices. By adopting barbarian gods, Rome didn't show weakness, but strength and a divine destiny to rule. It was an act of unification, not dilution. Both of you missed the mark. The personal beliefs of our emperors and leaders played a significant role in the integration of these deities. Take Augustus, for example, who was keen on revitalizing traditional Roman religious practices while also being politically astute enough to incorporate certain barbarian gods into the fold when it suited his needs. This discussion veers into the superficial, we must consider the socio-political incentives behind religious integration more critically. Rome's actions were a calculated effort to maintain control over conquered peoples, an extension of their diplomatic and military strategies. The gods themselves were merely tokens in this game of power. Thucydides makes a good point. However, it's essential to recognize the benefits that came from this religious syncretism. It allowed for a smoother transition of power and helped integrate diverse peoples into the empire, contributing to Rome's longevity. A smoother transition for whom? The conquerors or the conquered? In the end, Rome itself began to crumble, not because of external pressures alone, but because it lost what made it Roman. These religious adoptions were but symptoms of a greater malaise. It seems we find ourselves divided on whether the integration of barbarian gods was a sign of Rome's adaptability and strength, or an indication of its moral and spiritual decline. Yet this complex interweaving of deities and practices undoubtedly left a lasting legacy on the spiritual landscape of the empire and beyond, influencing how we perceive religious syncretism today. Let us delve into the murky waters of how Rome painted the barbarians in literature and art. 
These depictions often ranged from the heroic to the vilified. Tacitus, you're known for your sharp critique. Lead us off. How do you see Rome's portrayal of these peoples? Indeed, Rome has been cunning in its portrayal of barbarians. What we observe in the annals and the histories is an exaggeration tailored to serve Rome's agenda. The Germans, for example, were depicted as both noble savages and brutish threats, depending on Rome's political needs at the time. It's a manipulation of narrative to justify conquest and domination. My writings expose such duality, revealing the strategic deployment of propaganda. While Tacitus makes a good point about manipulation, it's crucial to understand that the portrayal of barbarians also helped Romans shape their own identity. Through contrasting themselves with these others, they carved a self-image of civilization and order. This dichotomy served more than just political ends. It was foundational to Roman societal norms and self-perception. Polybius, a fair observation on identity. But was this portrayal fair to the true nature of these so-called barbarians? Honestly, fairness was never the goal. The portraits crafted by our Roman counterparts were tools, political or otherwise. Yet in my analyses, the various accounts offer us a frame through which Roman values and fears can be examined. It's paramount to note, however, that Rome's narratives imbued with patriotism and a moralistic stance have also done justice to their subjects in some cases. By elevating the threat of the barbarian, the valor and virtues of the Roman response were equally magnified. It's through these accounts that the spirit of Rome is most vividly resurrected. Yet, we must question the reliability of these vivid accounts. Livy, your narratives, while thrilling, often blur the line between history and myth. The true nature of Roman barbarian interactions is likely far more complex and less flattering on both fronts. On that note, the personal quirks and vices of Rome's leaders as they dealt with these barbarians often reveal more about Roman society than the barbarians themselves. Take Caligula's and Nero's interactions with foreign kings and tribes. Their extravagance and folly in these dealings are a testament to their own barbarity, dressed in the guise of civilization. Precisely, Suetonius. It's the height of hypocrisy. Rome's leaders could often be as barbaric as those they sought to vilify. My own works criticize such leaders, not just for their moral failings, but for undermining the very fabric of Roman integrity. Well, it appears that our discussion leads us to a consensus of sorts. Rome's portrayal of barbarians serves as a mirror, reflecting the complex interplay between self-perception, others' perception, and the malleable nature of identity itself. Through both exaggeration and vilification, Rome not only justified its actions, but also fashioned a powerful narrative of civilization versus barbarism that has persisted through the centuries. Indeed, Herodotus. And let us not forget the role of the historian in all this, to dissect these narratives, challenge them, and in doing so, reveal the multifaceted truth that lies beneath. Let's direct our focus towards the individuals who swayed the tides of history with their leadership and command. Roman generals and barbarian warlords, their legacies are etched in the annals of time. Yet one must wonder what truly differentiated the leadership of Rome from that of the barbarians. Analyzing from a pragmatic stance, Roman generals were not simply leaders. They were the embodiment of Roman statecraft and military discipline. Contrary to the often glorified vision of barbarian warlords led by mere strength and courage, Roman generals operated under the auspices of the Senate and people of Rome. It's this institutional backing coupled with rigorous military innovations that afforded them a tactical edge. For instance, Scipio Africanus's strategies against Hannibal, not just mere courage, but strategy, foresight, and the ability to adapt were his weapons. While Polybius lauds the structured approach of Roman generals, one cannot overlook the raw, unbridled force of charisma that barbarian leaders wielded. Leaders like Arminius utilized deep knowledge of Roman tactics, which he once embraced as an ally, to devastating effect at the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest. It was not Roman strategic or tactical inferiority that led to their downfall, but underestimation and arrogance. The Romans could learn from the despised barbarian, flexibility and the power of surprise. I must interject, the glory of Rome's generals was not merely in their military acumen, but in their moral fiber, their vision for Rome, and their embodiment of Roman virtues. 
Look to the tales of Cincinnatus, called from his plough to defend Rome, serving without lust for power, embodying the ideal of civic duty above self. Such stories inspire, teaching generations the values upon which Rome was founded. Our barbarian counterparts, no matter how cunning, cannot claim such moral high ground or lasting influence. I find both your arguments idealized. Leadership, whether Roman or barbarian, was deeply personal, driven by ambitions, flaws, and the human condition. Take Caesar, a man of immense personal ambition. His conquests, while beneficial to Rome, were equally a pursuit of personal legacy. And let's not forget the power of scandal and charisma and leadership. Caesar's affair with Cleopatra is as much a part of his legacy as his reforms. These personal stories, human flaws, and ambitions shape history just as much as military tactics or virtues. To my point, the comparison between Roman generals and barbarian leaders must also consider the context of their respective societies. Leadership cannot be divorced from the societal and cultural frameworks within which it operates. The efficacy and style of leadership are influenced as much by these externalities as by the personal qualities of the leaders themselves. Furthermore, the narrative of history, written by the victors, often distorts the true nature of leadership on either side, glorifying one while vilifying the other. Indeed, the fabric of leadership is woven from various threads, personal ambition, societal expectation, military innovation, and not least, the interpretation of historians themselves. As leaders carve their paths through the annals of history, they are guided by the invisible hands of destiny and choice alike. The dialogue between Rome and the barbarians, through the lens of their leaders, reveals the multifaceted nature of power and its enduring impact on the world stage. Let us delve into the enduring legacy of Rome and its dealings with the barbarians. The rivers of history carry the echoes of their tumultuous interactions, shaping the bedrock of modern Europe. How do you perceive these reverberations in our present world? Rome's influence through its laws, infrastructure, and governance models forms the skeleton of modern political systems. The barbarians, on the other hand, injected a vigor a tenacity that underpins many European cultures. It's a fusion that crafted a resilient and diverse continent. This duality, this blending of order and chaos, is a testament to Rome's strategic diplomacy and military might, as well as to the indomitable spirit of those they termed barbarians. A fusion indeed, but not without its crucible of conflict. Your portrayal glosses over the decay, the corrosion Rome suffered because of barbarian pressures. Yes, Rome's legal and political frameworks endure, but so does the legacy of its failures, its eventual fragmentation. The barbarians didn't just contribute vigor, they exposed the vulnerabilities and hubris of an overstretched empire. Europe's political boundaries are etched by the scars of those ancient conflicts. While Tacitus makes a valid point about decay, it's crucial to analyze the broader picture. The blending of cultures, the resultant synthesis that emerged from the Roman barbarian interactions, paved the way for a geopolitical landscape so varied yet interconnected. The causality, the complex factors that led to Rome's downfall and the rise of barbarian kingdoms, illustrate the intricacies of power dynamics, migration, and cultural assimilation. Yet, in venerating Rome's legacy, we must not overlook the valor and wisdom of the barbarian leaders those who challenged Rome's hegemony and later assimilated its virtues. The barbarians were not mere pawns in Rome's grand design. They were architects of a new age, contributors to a legacy that valorized martial prowess as much as it did the rule of law and civic order. Architects or destroyers, Livy? Rome succumbed to internal decay exacerbated by barbarian invasions, a fact you elegantly overlook in your romanticization. Gentlemen, may I interject with a pragmatic observation? The evolution of military strategies and political institutions in response to barbarian influences has constructed the very fabric of European statecraft. This legacy, though marred by conflict and decay, underscores a fundamental truth. The dynamics of power and identity are perpetually in flux, influenced by the interplay of diverse cultures. Diverse indeed. The story of Rome and the barbarians is not solely one of conquest and subjugation, but also of integration and mutual influence. Whether through conflict or cooperation, these interactions laid the foundational stones of modern Europe, 
stones carved with the tales of both Roman and barbarian. Speaking of tales, let us not forget the personal dramas, emperors and warlords whose ambitions and follies shaped the destinies of countless lives. The legacy of Rome and the barbarians is also etched in the individual stories of leadership, betrayal, and ambition. The echoes of their deeds continue to guide, and sometimes misguide, the leaders of today. Indeed, Suetonius. The echoes of the past continue to resonate, shaping our present and guiding our future. The legacies of Rome and the barbarians, intertwined and complex, are a testament to the ever-changing human condition. To culminate our vigorous discourse on Rome and the barbarians, let us each bestow our final reflections, shorn of the niceties typical in less fervent assemblies. Polybius, would you light our path? Indeed, Herodotus. Our journey through Rome's interactions with the barbarians exposes a mosaic of pragmatism and ambition interlocked in the annals of history. My examinations reveal Rome's calculated embrace of engineering and diplomacy as not just tools of conquest, but as the sinews binding an empire. However, as our discussions unfolded, the subtleties of these interactions suggest that Rome's legacy is not merely one of subjugation and assimilation, but a more intricate mingling of cultures, shaping the continent's future. This duality, this ultimate pragmatism in the face of diverse challenges, underscores the Roman genius for adaptation a testament to their enduring legacy in the tapestry of European history. Thucydides, your scrutiny has often cooled the ardor of our debates. What insight do you depart us with? In the shadow of Polybius's optimism, I cast a light tempered by the realism inherent in human nature and political structures. Our exploration underscores the immense influence of force, strategy, and economic necessity in shaping the interactions between Rome and the barbarians. It is folly to romanticize these encounters. The migrations, battles, and exchanges were often dictated by survival, stark, pragmatic survival. The legacy these interactions have left upon modern Europe speaks less to a deliberate melding of cultures and more to the chaotic, unrelenting progression of human history, steered by necessity and ambition. Let me not mince words. The Rome we have dissected, noble as it may seem in its encounters with the barbarians, often cloaked its avarice and degradation in the guise of civilization and order. Our dialogue peels back the layers of Rome's veneer to reveal the rot within, catalyzed by these very interactions. The migrations exposed Rome's vulnerabilities, the cultural exchanges often a veneer for subjugation. Yet, ironically, in this decay blooms the seeds of modern Europe's identity, a culture born from the ashes of a crumbling empire and the vigor of its so-called barbarian adversaries. Suetonius, your anecdotes have breathed life into our characters. Share your concluding thoughts. This discourse has stripped bare the grandeur of Rome, revealing the all-too-human flaws of its leaders and their barbarian counterparts. My contributions sought not just to entertain, but to remind us of the undeniable impact of individual ambitions on the grand stage of history. These personal desires, petty grievances, and grandeurs have steered the course of events as much as the broader strokes of economic needs and military strategy. The legacy of Rome and its entanglement with the barbarians is not merely a matter of cultural or political evolution, but a deeply human drama, echoing through the ages into the here and now. Throughout our robust discussions, I have held fast to the view that Rome's interactions with the barbarians, fraught though they were with conflict and ambition, ultimately sowed the seeds of a unified cultural and political identity across Europe. The strategic genius of Roman leadership, the moral fortitude of its people, and the shared, though often contested, values between Rome and the barbarian tribes forged a legacy that transcends mere survival. This legacy, rooted in Rome's ideals, even in the face of its failures and moral lapses, has rippled through the centuries, shaping the foundational principles of modern Europe. My role as moderator compels me to weave together these threads you have all laid out, though I dare say the pattern is as complex as the interactions we have explored. Our examination has flitted through the varied landscape of Rome's relationship with the barbarians, from battlefield to the marketplace, from temple to council chamber. We have uncovered not a linear narrative, but a convoluted web of strategies, economies, and ideologies, 
all contributing to the mosaic of European identity. If history teaches us anything, it is that no empire, no culture, no idea stands in isolation. The dynamic interplay between Rome and the barbarians is a testament to the perpetual motion of human history, where every conflict, every alliance, every exchange weaves into the endless story of humanity's reach for greatness, often flawed, always aspiring.